Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. I'm going to share another little thing before we go back to the Social Security planning again from uh, Tony Robbins' book. Uh, this one is Unshakable, his latest book out. And one of the things he talked about is about uh, understanding how advisors, um, you know, the difference between what he put it, there are brokers, independent advisors, or what are called duly registered advisors. And I found this kind of interesting too, because again, I love numbers, right? So here's what we got. Registered investment advisors. Let's first look at the total amount. There are 308,937 financial advisors in the United States. So think about that. Over 300,000 financial advisors in the United States, and yet only 31,000, approximately 10%, are registered investment advisors. Okay, so our firm, of course, as I mentioned to you, I was in the broker dealer system for many years and changed over about a little over 12 years ago, I guess it was actually, and became a registered investment advisor. All right, so again, only 10% of us out there are registered investment advisor of the financial advisors that are uh, in, the, in, a, in our country. All right, also known as RIAs or independent advisors. All right, so like doctors and lawyers, we have a fiduciary duty and a legal obligation to act in our client's best interests at all times, okay? Now that may seem like common sense, but it's a, there's a difference between suitability. Uh, Tony uses a great little example here. He says, when it comes to suitability, what does that mean? You know, suitability is extremely low bar to clear. Do you dream of marrying a suitable person or your soulmate, okay? So for a broker, you know, suitable could mean a lot of things. But what we're looking at basically with acting in your best interest is quite a high bar and, it means, and being able, the legal standard again, that you have to show, in fact, that you're acting in your client's best interest and putting those ahead of all others, including your own, and that's extremely important. So this is one of the things as he gets into this as well. There are also what are called duly registered advisors. These are advisors that may be broker in the broker dealer system, registered reps, and then they may be also associate RIAs in that firm or associate registered investment advisors. So in that situation, it's a little different, you know, in terms of they kind of got one foot in both worlds on that side. So what's the difference again? Well, when you're looking at those that are um, let's see where the numbers were again. Basically from that, you break it down even further. If you take out the duly registered advisors, then you break it, then you only have, which is about 25,000, you end up with 1.6, here it is, I couldn't find my space, here we are. In fact, as many as 26,000 out of the 31,000 RIAs operate in this gray area where they have one foot in both camp. So basically that means there's only 5,000 out of 310,000 advisors in the United States that are true fiduciaries, RIAs. So basically about 1.6%. He goes on in how to do some other things about finding the right advisors. And we'll probably talk about that in future shows. For right now though, I wanna make sure we don't miss on this, but this is something that's important too. When you're working, the other part is he gets into the bar about what you're looking for. It's not just the fiduciary part, which is important, but there's another part, and that has to do with the expertise. Okay, when you're dealing with advisors, is that all they're doing is just on the investment side, or are they looking at the total picture when it comes to financial planning? And how do you find the right fit? You know, someone, because this is one of the areas with my clients, I've got clients uh, that go back as long as I've been in business, you know, 20, 25 years plus, and one of the things with that is that you've got a long-term relationship. Sometimes I've lost clients over the years, of course, and their children have become clients. And this is one of those areas where that continues on because the relationship that we have is one of making sure we get into all aspects to help you, uh, again, attain, maintain that standard of living and quality of life. And it involves a lot more than just an investment plan. That's just one small piece of the puzzle. And it's an important part, but just one part. And this is where Social Security again comes in. Rules for survivor benefits, we're gonna talk about briefly. The couple must have been married at least nine months at the, st at the date of death. Oh, before I do that, almost forgot. First 10 callers, right? You wanna take advantage of some of this. You wanna have your own plan. Here's how you do it. A specific plan to your specific situation. If you want that free retirement income analysis, that comprehensive financial plan at no cost for the first 10 callers only, 
Tess is standing by to take your information. She'll send you out a checklist of things to bring to your appointment. Now, let me be clear. You know, during the, we replay the show during the weekend. And when we do that, it may say, you know, don't call as far as callers calling into the show. That doesn't mean you can't call the office. We'll have people standing by over the weekend as well that can take your call and make sure you can also get in to see me and have that free retirement income analysis done. So again, whether, whether you're seeing me on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, call in 615-376-5325. If you're one of the first 10 callers, Tess will send you out a packet. It'll include a checklist of things to bring to your appointment with me. And in addition, when you come in, I'm gonna give you a free copy of my book, Seven Steps to Financial Freedom in Retirement. All right, all of that at no charge for the first 10 callers, 615-376-5325. Okay, rules for survivor benefits. So let's jump into that real quick. Couple must have been married at least nine months at the date of death. All right, except in the case of an accident. Survivor must be at least 60 for reduced benefit, 50 if disabled, or full retirement age for full benefit. So understanding how this works, and this, there's a potentially, depending on the age of the, of the widow and whether or not there are children involved, there's a lot of other things that can come into place there. A divorced spouse survivor benefit available if the marriage lasted again at least 10 years. Now here's question number three. Baby boomer, Social Security, question number three. When should I apply for benefits? This is one of the big ones. We were kind of covering that, right? When we're talking about 62, do I wait 65, 66, 67, 70? All these questions. Well, here's some factors to consider. And this is why it's so specific to your situation. One, your health status. All right, a lot of times, you know, I've got clients that come in, and recently it's been, in the last week, I think I've had at least three or four clients that have come in that have parents that are in their 90s. One that, uh, has a mother that's 102 years old. Amazing, right? Uh, and 95, you know, this is, people are living longer. And so this is one of the considerations. So on the, there we go. So health status is one of those, and your, your family history is another. So now family history kind of gives you an expectation. You might say, well, wow, mom and dad lived to be, you know, into their 80s or into their 90s or whatever it might be, or they're still around, you know, they're still living now and, and doing quite well. well. And in your own health status, do you have any health issues? Because even if you've had parents that have died young, uh, were their lifestyles considerably different than yours? Do you have a healthy lifestyle and your expectancy is gonna be greater? And of course, the medical technology today is amazing. People are definitely living longer. Life expectancy 80, is in the mid 80s for the most part, like 82, 83 for a man. Uh, I think it's 86, 87 for a woman. Need for income. This is one of those things, you know, as much as you may, you know, maybe better to wait, but if you can't get by right now, well, maybe we have to do what we have to do and we have to figure out some other strategies to make sure that you can add to that income in other ways. Whether or not you plan to work in retirement, this is a big one. We're gonna talk about that because that could affect your benefits dramatically and what the survivor needs gonna be. Maybe, you, you know, many times I have clients come in and there might be an age difference. There might be a 10, 12 year or more difference between this age difference between the spouses. So what, if one waits to age 70, even though that uh, and, and let's say you've got a spouse that is 10 years younger you, than you and they're going to uh, start taking benefits at age 66 based on your earnings. If you wait until age 70, it, if you predecease them, which you know, going to be more likely with that age difference, then they're going to get that higher age 70 benefit as well. So that's one reason and we'll get into some more reasons of why to delay benefits and when the best time might be to take them and how all that fits together in your plan to make sure you're able again to attain and maintain your standard of living, your quality of life, have some fun money, enjoy life when, uh, when the time comes for retiring or let's just say maybe taking it a little easier, okay? We'll get into that and more as soon as we return from this break. Join me here, we'll be right back on the Retirement Report.